You know, I've never been a fan of scary movies. I've never really seen the point of being scared and frightened just for the thrill of it. Uh, that seems kind of like common sense to me. And perhaps the attraction to those kind of uh, movies or shows that are uh, that scare you is the relief that comes after realizing it's not really real. It's kind of like being awakened from a nightmare and the relief you feel because it isn't real. You know, we've all had that. At least I, I, I assume everybody has had those kind of experiences. Um, but for many people, Satan is kind of like one of those bad dreams. He isn't real. It's just something their imagination comes up with or people have thought about it. And this dismissal of the existence of Satan plays right into his evil purposes for what enemy doesn't wish he had the gift of invisibility? But a greater concern, even of that, is the that most believers will discount the serious nature of spiritual warfare. And consequently, fall victim to the schemes of the enemy. While we don't fear the devil, we must respect his power and his position. For scripture tells us he is the prince of the power of the air. You know, when Adam was created, he was given dominion over all things. Over all the earth and all it contains. But by rebelling against God and obeying and falling to the temptation in the garden, Satan or Adam's sin resulted in giving over that dominion of the earth to Satan. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, one of the temptations that Satan offered him was to take him on to a a high point and show him all the kingdoms of the world and saying, if you'll fall down and worship me, I will give you all of these kingdoms. It's noteworthy that Jesus never disputed Satan's right to do so. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He had that authority to make that offer. Satan rules a world system that opposes righteousness and opposes the plan of God. And God's plan for redeeming mankind and all creation is opposed by Satan. And as redeemed individuals, we stand in Satan's way. And as believers, we are in his crosshairs. It's like we all have targets on our back. He is our adversary. He's constantly tempting us to sin. And then he turns around and accuses us of yielding to that sin. Therefore, we need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. We are in the fight of our lives. Follow along, we've come to Ephesians chapter 6 in this portion which talks about spiritual warfare. I'll be reading verses 10 through 12 of Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. I want to discuss, discuss the, uh, the struggle that we are in. All that we've been taught in the first five and a half chapters of Ephesians have led us to this point. That's the force of the world, finally. These verses are much more than just a conclusion. You know, I might be giving a message and say, well, finally, and you kind of heave a sigh of relief, I'm not finished. But he's saying, in conclusion, here is the whole reason I've given you all these things. 
the culmination, the finale, the climax of the letter. Pastor T.D. Jakes in his book, Overcoming the Enemy, states it like this. By the time we come to Ephesians 6.10, we are perfected for ministry, and we have been corporately edified, unified, and made doctrinally wind resistant. Now Paul is going to tell us the point of everything we've learned and all the training we've been through. God has prepared us for spiritual warfare. We have been chosen and prepared to carry out God's plan in the strength and might of the Lord. We are ambassadors for Christ, as 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us. And we are frontline soldiers in the struggle for men's souls. And we carry the precious, life-giving message of the gospel. Therefore, Satan does everything in his power to discourage us and to sidetrack us from our mission. These verses here in Ephesians 6 are the best summary of the battle, but they aren't the only verses in the Bible that talk about that. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3-5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are taking every thought we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Paul tells Timothy, his disciple, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And Paul summarizes his life to Timothy with the words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. So you see that the motif of warfare throughout the New Testament. Now Jesus won the ultimate victory over Satan, over sin, and over death at the cross and by his resurrection. He turned Satan's plan upside down and what Satan thought was his greatest victory turned out to be his ultimate defeat. In the words of R. Arthur Matthews in his book Born for Battle, he says this, Nailing his feet to that cross could not prevent him from crushing Satan's head beneath his heel. And although Satan was ultimately defeated at the cross, though the victory stroke was delivered, his head was crushed, final skirmishes and battle continued to rage. And though his judgment has been posted, he has not yet been imprisoned. And although victory is certain, Satan is self-defeated, or is self deceived, and he continues to fight. He has deceived himself to think he can win, so he continues the battle. His bitter enmity and venom is now directed against you and me, against the church of Jesus Christ. And Satan attacks the head through the body. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, and we are the body, and he attacks the head through the body. His fiery darts are directed against all believers to try and steal the results of the finished work of Christ in its full effect among men. So he's trying to thwart the purposes and plan of God. Now listen to me, because this is important. Any believer who has not learned how to take his position in the heavenly places in Christ by faith any believer who attempts to face the enemy without continually donning the, the full armor of Christ will find themselves defeated. Just as Jesus came to earth for battle and to defeat the works of the devil, each one of us cannot remain a civilian in this war. We have no option to stand idly by out of the battle. We can't be spiritual pacifists. We're to be active soldiers, or we'll live in spiritual poverty and spiritual defeat. We were born for battle. We were born for victory. As the battle rages, we must realize something very basic, kind of the bottom line of all this. The battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. 
It can't be fought with the puny weapons of a pledge. It'd be ridiculous to try to stop an army of tanks with BB guns. Just kind of get that image in your mind, trying to attack a tank with a BB gun. But that's what it'd be like if we tried to defeat Satan with fleshly weapons, such as better time management, just trying harder, staying busy, or even worse, rationalizing our sin. Satan is a powerful foe, and the battle is fought on spiritual turf. And Paul tells us in verse 10 to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his mind. The first three chapters of Ephesians told us who we are in Christ, our spiritual identity. The last three chapters are telling us how to apply those truths in a practical manner. And it all comes down to those truths in Ephesians 5 when it says we are to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't have the Holy Spirit in control of our lives, then we're vulnerable in this battle in which we find ourselves. As we put Christ at the very center of our lives, he becomes the frame into all of our activities and everything that we do. He's the frame. He's not just a piece of the puzzle. He is the frame that everything is to fit into. And being filled with the Spirit, being continually filled, confessing sin immediately, yielding to the Spirit's control, is a pathway to victory in this fight of our lives. So let's examine Satan's war strategy. Verse 11 tells us to put on the full armor of God. That's defined in verses 13 and following. We'll get into that next week. But we're told that Satan works against us through schemes. Now, schemes are plans, plots, methods, strategies to accomplish a goal. So Satan has a goal to defeat us, to make us miserable, to destroy the works of God in our lives. And he has a strategy to do that. Neil Anderson, founder and president emeritus of a group called Freedom in Christ, formerly he was chairman of the Practical Theology Department of Talbot Seminary, has said this. He describes how Satan and his evil spirits <laughs> interfere with our lives. He says, imagine you're standing at the end of a long, narrow street lined on both sides with two-story row houses. At the other end of the street stands Jesus Christ. And your Christian life is a process of walking down that long street of maturity in Him. Now, there's absolutely nothing in the street that can keep you from reaching Jesus. So when you receive Christ, you fix your eyes on Him and you start walking. And the Christian life is like that long walk down that narrow street that is uh, bordered by two-story road houses. So get that in your mind. But since this world is still under the dominion of Satan, the road houses on either side of you are inhabited by beings who are committed to keeping you from reaching your goal. They have no power or authority to block your path or even to slow your step. So they hang out of the windows and they call to you, hoping to turn your attention away from your goal to disrupt your progress. One of the ways they'll try to distract you is by calling out, hey, look over here. I've got something you really want. It tastes good. It feels good. It's a lot more fun than that boring walk right down the middle of the street. Come on in. Take a look. And that is temptation. Suggesting to your mind ways to serve yourself instead of God. So as you continue your walk with Christ down the middle of the road, you also have thoughts like, I'm stupid. I'm ugly. I'll never amount to anything for God. Satan's emissaries are masters and accusation. Especially after they've distracted you through temptation. One minute they're saying, hey, try this, there's nothing wrong with it. And then when you yield, they're right there saying, see what you did? 
How can you call yourself a Christian if you've done that? If you behave like that? Accusation is another one of Satan's primary weapons in an attempt to distract you from your goal. So you've got temptation and you've got accusation. Other remarks, which are probably you as you walk down the street, sound like this. You don't need to go to church today. It's not important to pray. It's not important to read God's Word every day. Some of this New Age stuff isn't so bad. That's deception. And it's one of Satan's most subtle and debilitating weapons. Remember, Satan is called the father of lies. What's the enemy's goal in having his demons jeer at you, taunt you, lure you, and question you from the windows and doorways along your path? He wants you to slow down. He wants you to stop, sit down, and possibly even give up your journey toward Christ. He wants to influence you to doubt your ability to believe and to serve God. Now remember, he has absolutely no power or authority to keep you from steadily progressing in your walk toward Christ. He can never again own you because you've been redeemed by Jesus Christ, you're forever in him. But if he can get you to listen to the thoughts he plants in your mind, he can influence you. And if you allow him to influence you long enough through temptation, accusation, and deception, he can control you. The arena of the mind is Satan's most effective front in the spiritual war. Our thought life needs to be kept and taken under control of the Holy Spirit, or will be a casualty who contributes very little, very little to the war effort. For to serve God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. Romans chapter 1 speaks of the depraved mind, which is the final result of the downward spiral of giving sin free reign in our lives. And Satan has such a one securely enslaved. We're to talk, we're to take every thought captive to Christ. Now I was thinking, how do we do that? What are some, some, some practical ways we can do that? Well, it's kind of like an idle mind is the devil's workshop, you know, like idle hands are. So it's good if we fill our minds with, with good things. Uh, I appreciate Lola reading that scripture about, you know, if from Ephesians, or Philippians 4, you know, whatever is pure, whatever is good, whatever is honorable, let your mind dwell on those things. I found Christian music is very valuable. To listen to Christian music through the day, if you're working, if you're doing housework, if you're whatever you're doing, you know, Christian music is wonderful gift God's given us to listen and, and uh, just let your mind dwell on those things. Satan loves to make us worry. As we have memorized scripture is a wonderful way of filling our mind with something good instead of something negative. The world is full of negative things and it's like those voices calling as we're walking down the street that they're calling and they're, they're putting negative thoughts into our mind. And we've got to take each one of those thoughts captive and say, no, I'm not going to think on that. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to give that to Christ and pray about it and then go on. The arena of the mind is Satan's most effective front in the spiritual war. He works in our mind. He deceives. He accuses. He tempts us. He whispers lies. He spreads doubts and lies about God about God's people, about life in general. He uses discouragement, which leads to disillusionment, leading to depression, which leads to despair. That's spiritual warfare. And while we're presently free from physical attacks against our church, speaking right here, right now, Satan often incites often violence against believers. I found this comment about Christian persecution from uh, a watchdog organization called Open Doors. How many are familiar with, with Open Doors? You need to be. It's a, it's a great 
they, um, they're kind of a watchdog against violence against Christians worldwide. Anyway, in their um, 2019 report, which was the latest one that I could find, they, uh, they said that in 2019, more than 9,000 churches and Christian buildings were attacked in 51 countries. More than 5,500 of those attacks took place in China. This number represents a more than 1,000% increase since 2018. So in one year, 1,000% increase in persecution. Notable violence numbers from 2019. And this is just what they could, they could find, and probably the, hot, the uh, numbers are higher than this. But they were able to identify 2,983 Christians being killed for their faith. 8,537 Christians were raped or sexually harassed for their faith. 9,488 churches or Christian buildings were attacked. 3,700 Christians were unjustly arrested or imprisoned. 1,052 Christians were abducted for faith-related reasons. A lot of those were in Nigeria, where the Boko Haram is kidnapping and going into Christian schools and kidnapping uh, young girls. 3,315 Christian homes were attacked, burned, or destroyed. As I said, that's not happening right here in our neighborhood, or in our country, although there are some persecution that's a little bit less overt. But we must be spiritually prepared for such physical persecution if and when it comes. Right now, we should be praying and even financially supporting the persecuted church around the world. Uh, Voice of the Martyrs is a good organization to uh, to follow, telling about that sort of thing. Well, as we're involved in spiritual warfare, we've also got to realize that we are fighting against an organized foe, an organized evil army. Verse 12 defines the vast organization that Satan has a right against us in God's plan. The vast demonic force of the people extend Satan's effectiveness and his influence. You see, Satan is a finite person, a finite ability. Or he has a, a finite ability to be in one place at one point, at one time. You know, people who might might say Satan is oppressing me, but it's most likely his demons. But his forces are orderly, well-disciplined, and have thousands of years of experience with people. Understand that the evil angels that fell with Satan, when Satan fell, they've been around since the beginning of time. They have a lot of experience. Thousands of years of experience with people, and understanding people, and understanding the weakness of the people. They are organized, and they are brilliant. Those fallen angels, as I said, are intelligent, powerful, and it's utterly foolish to think we can defeat them without the might and the power of the Lord and without his armor. Scripture supports that demons exist in ranks of authorities, just as the holy angels do. In the book of Daniel, we have an instance. We learn something about those ranks. Daniel had been praying for over three weeks for an answer to prayer. He hadn't been getting any answer. He hadn't been getting any relief. And suddenly an angel appeared to him with these words. Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day you set your heart on understanding this and are humbling and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I've come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. In other words, this holy messenger from God was, was opposed in coming to deliver a message to Daniel by an evil demon called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And this was a powerful, high-ranking demon called a prince, and his jurisdiction was over the kingdom of Persia. It's been suggested 
that there are specific high-ranking demons that have been assigned to every nation, assisted by a vast army of underlings who have jurisdiction over states and cities, towns, and so forth. I think it's very possible that Satan has assigned specific demons to oppose each individual church. While that's a bit speculative, the point is that Satan's forces are highly organized. God's angels are equally organized. And from Daniel we surmise that there's a great warfare always going on in the heavenly places between angels in the spiritual realm. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. As we conclude, and this is a real conclusion, there are two extremes we've got to avoid when we're thinking about spiritual warfare, and spiritual demons, and Satan and his work. One is the tendency to see demons under, under every rock and behind every problem. A lot of the times, our problems are ourselves. We're our own worst enemy. Satan uses that against us. But sometimes, you know, we fight against the flesh and the devil and the world. So we don't need to give Satan more credit than he's due. I don't think there's any scriptural basis, and you've probably heard it, that there's a demon of alcoholism, there's a demon of lust, there's a demon of every particular problem. I think that demons use whatever temptation, whatever weakness we have against us. And because of their vast experience in dealing with humans, they take advantage of all the weaknesses. And while demons work and exist under Satan's control all over our world, in our culture, they primarily work quietly and effectively in conjunction with, their, with our own selfish and willful nature. Demons seldom reveal themselves. In over 50 years of ministry, I can only think of one time when I was firmly convinced I was dealing with the demonic. One time in 50 years. Now, if you're a missionary in some of the third world countries, some of the developing countries, you may deal with demonism every day. But most of the time, they work behind the scenes, very effectively, but maybe not so overtly. However, and this is something I'm sure that if you are involved in media at all, you would realize this. In the last few years in the entertainment field, I've noticed a great number of movies and television shows that deal with supernatural currently offered on both free and cable television are such programs as Lucifer, Discovery of Witches, one that I've seen advertised is called Evil, Legacies, which are stories about the offspring of vampires and werewolves, Stranger Things and American Horror Stories, to name only a few. And it goes without saying that Christians should avoid watching such things as that. Those programs are not harmless entertainment. The second extreme is to discount Satan and demons altogether and just think, well, that's not important. This error is reflected in George Barna's surveys, which reveal that almost half of Americans believe that Satan doesn't even exist. And even more troubling, is that 70% of those who would call themselves Christians, this is the broad, broad Christian uh, category, see Satan only as a symbol of evil rather than a person. That would be like calling the Satan instead of Satan. The truth lies in the middle of those two extremes. Now I'm seeing Satan responsible for everything, and demons responsible for everything that goes wrong, but also discounting him completely. The biblical view of Satan realizes that he's real, that he's powerful, that he's organized in opposing the believer, the church, and God's plan in the world. And even though he's been defeated on the cross, his faith has been sealed, he continues his work of opposition. We cannot resist him in our own power. 
will be defeated if we try. This is why it's vital to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We need never fear Satan. That's another of his weapons against the fear. Satan, we don't need to do that because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. We want to fear Satan, but we do respect his power and we do understand we need to put on the armor of God. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that Satan is a defeated foe. We thank you that we don't have to fear him, that the, the power of death has been taken from him. We don't need to fear death. We don't need to fear uh, the forces of evil. Father, we recognize that there is a battle going on. And Father, we thank you that you've equipped us. You've given us the equipment, the spiritual armor. You've given us the, the weapon, the shield of faith. You've given us the sword of the Spirit, Father, that we can fight against the forces of evil. And Father, we pray you help us to realize and to meditate on these things and realize we are sword, soldiers in this war. But we are soldiers that have been guaranteed victory. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.